Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed by your grace. Forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house. And for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord.
these people on earth. God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example, point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow your commands through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the third chapter of Exodus. In this passage, Moses experienced the call of God when God appeared to him in a bush that burned but was not consumed. When Moses expressed his unworthiness, God promised to be with him. When Moses objected that people would demand to know God's name, God revealed his personal name, Yahweh, I am who I am or the Lord. Israel discovered God's true identity when God took them out of Egypt. The reading. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, 
the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Give judgment for me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes. I have walked a fully with you. I have not sat with the worthless, nor do I consort with the deceitful. I have hated the company of evildoers. I will not sit down with the wicked. I will wash my hands in the innocence, O Lord. And I may go in procession round your altar, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving, and recounting all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house in which you dwell, and the place where your glory abides. In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, which is our second reading, Paul presents benchmarks for faithful relationships with Christians and non-Christians. Love is the unflagging standard of our behavior. When we encounter evil, we do not resort to its tactics, but seek to overcome it with good. While Christians cannot control the actions and attitudes of others, we seek to live at peace with all people. The reading. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. 
bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. Today's Gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom." The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. After months of not being able to worship with congregations in person, it's been fun the last couple of Sundays to be present for a few installation services. Granted, they were small. The installation of Pastor Lenny Duncan and the installation of Pastor Jean DeVold Donaldson did not involve the congregation as a whole in person as it might have previously. But there was an online community and I was able to be in person even if the laying on of hands and the blessing meant that it had to happen at a distance. Installations and ordinations that are now starting to occur are rituals that publicly mark the commissioning of a pastor a community of faith and pastor together as they embark on a chapter of ministry together. The story of how a pastor and community of faith is called to partner together often involves a myriad of questions, wonderings, fears, anxieties, dreams, and faith. The story from Exodus 
is a prophetic commissioning scene. The story of Moses' call and God speaking through the burning bush is often referenced in scripture. It tells the calling of the first of all the Israelite prophets, the great leader of the Exodus, who confronted a powerful Pharaoh and led God's people, the Hebrew slaves, to freedom and on a wilderness journey toward the promised land. Moses, in this scene that we hear today, is not the powerful, idealized leader portrayed in scripture and art. Moses sounds a bit more like the person described in the song, Standing Still by Jewel. Cutting through the darkest nights are my two headlights, trying to keep it clear, but I'm losing it here to the twilight. There's a dead end to my left, there's a burning bush to my right. You aren't in sight, you aren't in sight. In Exodus 2, Moses calls himself an alien residing in a foreign land. Moses has never really been at home anywhere. Raised by his Hebrew mother, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and given an Egyptian name. When he tries to intervene to help his kinfolk, the Hebrews, he ends up murdering an Egyptian and is rejected by his own people. Moses flees to Egypt and and the mess he had created there, only to be identified as Egyptian by women he meets at the well in Midian. From the adopted son of royalty, Moses is now shepherding flocks, working for his father-in-law. I share Moses' backstory here because it's one that reminds us that this story is more about God's initiation, God's invitation, and God's equipping of one who God commissions. Verse 8 says, God comes down. God meets us where we are, even when we're not always where we should be. Moses is not necessarily where he should be either. But the sight of the burning bush and God's call will bring him out of isolation, sending Moses back to Egypt to lead the Israelite flock. But even for God, the task of getting Moses on track is no simple matter. Moses hid his face because he was afraid. One of my wonderings about this story is about Moses' fear. What was Moses afraid of? Was he afraid of the presence of God in the burning bush? I also wonder, did Moses' fear have something to do with what he feared God might be calling him to? Was he afraid he might not be worthy enough, good enough, capable, articulate, adaptable? Was he afraid of the future? Was he afraid of failure? These are all human fears we have. We all have fears of some kind. We can also have these fears in our lives as congregations. When congregations make decisions about their future, perhaps it is the call of a pastor about the direction of ministry or a potential partnership or even about mission priorities or budget concerns. We have fears about the future. We can have fears about the future. Fear about that our congregation will die or not be relevant. Do we fear what our congregations might look like if they become more welcoming to our neighbors? Do we fear what our congregations will look like after the pandemic? Do we fear what our congregations might look like if others come and join us and help make decisions and bring their gifts? I know that sounds silly. Most congregations think they're pretty welcoming Congregations often are places where people feel and experience God's love firsthand, where God's love abides and where people feel welcome. In the Christian Century article that came out this week, I read that while a number of multicultural, multiracial churches in which at least one out of every five members is from a minority background grew from 6% in 1998 
to 16% in 2019, during that time, these same congregations didn't become more racially diverse. African-American membership in them declined between 2012 to 2019. Multiracial congregations typically have white leadership, quoted the article, and worship style more attuned with white ways of worship. I wonder if this reflects our fears. How does this relate to our fears? When we think about our congregational ministry, when we think about worship, will an openness to gifts of diversity in our congregation change what I feel is most precious? Will it mean we sing songs I don't know or like? Does it mean I will lose what I know and hold most dear or value? Will I lose my place of privilege if we welcome others? Am I, are, am I afraid of the future at this moment because it's largely unknown? Are we afraid of a future that seems so precarious at this time? There's many fears congregations can name. It's powerful to name the fears that face us because in doing so, those fears have less power over us. There's much to fear in these days. And I invite you this week to name the fears you have. By naming the fears we have, we can make space for God's promises, God's love, God's presence. By naming and claiming the fears we hold, we make space to talk about how it is that God's love wants to break into those fears and move and claim us despite them. Moses' first objection in Exodus is that he questions his own identity. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses here seems to fear his authority in the face of a powerful Pharaoh. Then he speaks to fears that he might not have the right words. Yet God promises, I will be with you. I am who I am, says God. And God gives Moses the words that speak to God's faithfulness throughout the generations. God's work is aligned and intertwined with human agency, just as Moses saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew and Pharaoh's daughter saw the child and heard him crying, and also as God observed and saw the misery of God's people. God doesn't watch idly or passively, but moves to action. Seeing, knowing, and acting is a very part of the identity of God. As much as Moses' identity emerges from his past, so God's actions in the present emerge from God's commitments to the ancestors. The God of Exodus is one who remains faithful to the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The commissioning of Moses isn't limited to prophets or pastors. God commissions each one of us to do God's work in our daily lives. This may happen in unnoticed ways we care for our neighbors or in ways we feel called to make commitments or take new directions in ministry as congregations, as we vote together and make public declarations. Where are you experiencing God's commissioning for you in these days? How is God speaking to you? Though it may not be through a burning bush, where do you hear God's voice most clearly? Unlike human commitments that waver and fade, God's identity will be constant, even while Moses is tending sheep on an isolated mountain, and when we live in a pandemic-related isolation from one another. God will be known in God's future faithfulness to Moses and the people. 
I will be with you, God promises. Let us hear the word of promise and commission in our daily lives. And know we are not alone. The one who is with us will remain with us even when we acknowledge our fears and dare to speak them to one another. Let us live in the promise that God is still speaking to us and commissioning us for service for the sake of the world God so loves. Amen. Join me now in saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your Church on divine things. Grant us trust in you, that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ, and thereby discover joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you do. As the seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, you call us to live peaceably with all. Give us ears to hear one another, even those we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding, that they advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promised to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain. Raise the spirits of those who are despairing and heal the sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. Help us overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall your holy ones who now live in your undying light. In our remembering, give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, also with, with you. you.
Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are the signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit, bless us, your servants, and these, your gifts, of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. 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 Now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends of Jesus, come to the table. Receive nourishment for your journey, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
present at our table, Lord, be here and everywhere adored. Bless these thy gifts, and grant that we may feast in fellowship with thee. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament, and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence, through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you 
in eternal love. Amen. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.